Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless well america's school children are struggling to read and write so why are we teaching them about sex all day instead of using a bible a pennsylvania school board president swore in on a stack of graphic sex novels and I'm not talking about To Kill a Mockingbird. We're talking about deeply sexual content, way too graphic for school. Some school board members in Fairfax, Virginia, did the same thing last week, like Carl Frisch, current vice chair and soon-to-be chair of the board. I, Carl V. Frisch, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Those books he was sworn in on. Well, they've been banned in several districts for depicting things like underage gay porn. And Carl's been on the board since 2019 and just two years ago. Carl was at a meeting where an outraged parent spoke out about all this. And one of the books he was upset with was uh, Gender Queer and Lawn Boy. Both of these books include pedophilia, sex between men and boys. Both books describe different acts. One book describes a fourth grade boy performing <laughs> on an adult male. The other book has detailed illustrations of a man having <laughs> with a boy. Quote, I can't wait to have your <laughs> in my mouth. This is not an oversight at Fairfax High I'm School. Sorry. Sure. This I, yes. I material, a point of, there are children in the audience here. Do not like, interrupt my under. time. Carl later went on to mock that parent, calling her testimony an exorcism. Didn't know he was so deeply religious. Since Carl joined the board, he's bragged about how he's the first openly LGBTQ member elected to local office in Fairfax, and apparently it's been exhausting for him. Making LGBTQIA history is exhausting but it's critical work. IA? When did we add IA? That's new. It's no surprise Carl's playing identity politics. He's learned from the best. From working for Senate Democrats to spending time with every Democrat under the sun, Biden, Obama, Mayor Pete, Beto, my favorite, Kamala. Carl was even comms director for Media Matters. <laughs> and now on January 1st, Carl will officially take over as the board chair. The only problem? Well, one of many, Carl doesn't have any kids. He has a partner, Evan, who you saw holding the stack of filthy books. Evan's a school choir director in Fairfax, but they have no kids. Why is a Media Matters maniac with no children invested in his local school curriculum like this? And why is this man insisting the curriculum be so sexualized? He's not a parent, he's not a stakeholder, he's an activist. Think that guy's going to boost test scores? He's not there for that. You know exactly what he's there for. Romans chapter 1 tells us God has revealed to mankind that he is the creator of all things and that he has made it known to mankind that they are without excuse through his creation that he exists. God demands that we worship him and recognize him as the creator. And when a society does not glorify him as God, he gives them up to three phases of judgment. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart. The second phase of judgment is of the body, verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. First, the heart is rotten, then the body follows, and then the mind goes. The moral law of God written on the heart has literally been stomped out and replaced with cultural immorality. Immorality now goes in every direction. 
The mind is corrupt. People don't think right. They advocate all the wretched things and depreciate all the virtuous things. And what flows out of this pornographic, homosexual, depraved culture? All evil. Verses 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It is evident by looking at society that we are in the third and final judgment on America. In these last days, society has not retained God in their knowledge, and in return, God has given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. When a nation tells God that they no longer want or need him and actually tell him to go away so they can wallow in their sins, eventually God says, okay. Nick Freitas is a Virginia State delegate and host of Making the Argument with Nick Freitas. I'm a little alarmed by this guy. Does he make you suspicious? Jesse, when you look at this, I, I don't think it should, I understand my parents are mad. I don't understand why they're surprised anymore. This is just the sort of thing, this is part of the agenda. This is not a bug, this is a feature of the agenda. And you have individuals like this who, like you just described, are, are far less interested in their, their reading and writing and their ability to comprehend mathematics and far more interested in exposing your 13-year-old to pornography in their public school library. And so I, I think at this point, again, be mad, but stop being surprised. This, you're gonna see more of it as we go, and it's gonna get worse. Yeah, he's an alphabet crusader. You don't hear a lot about improved math, science, reading scores. You don't hear that. You just hear about graphic porn novels that the kids must read. They must understand them, and everybody must be tolerant of that. Is there any outrage at all at the local level, or is this basically now long gone? This guy won with 65% of the vote in his district. <laughs> oh, my God. Here's what some of us try to do in Virginia is say that this is not appropriate material for 13-year-old kids in public school libraries. And we got called book burners. We said we wanted, they said we wanted to censor. Do you think it's, it's odd that a guy with no children wants to be on the school board? Okay. <laughs> Every time we bring up stuff like this, we get people like us get called divisive, right? We're being divisive. We're being outrageous. I'm telling you right now, within two to three years, we're going to see prominent elected Democrats and prominent Democrat college professors advocating for the idea that pedophilia is not a perversion, it's a preference. And they're not pedophiles, they're minor attracted persons. And you're gonna to start to see this become more common. The pedophiles now want their sin legalized and we are seeing a big push for sexualizing children. God gives a dire warning to anyone who would cause a child to sin as we read in Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Now, when I say that now, everyone says I'm being divisive. I'm being hyperbolic. But if five years ago I had told you that there was gonna be an active push to keep these sort of pornographic materials in your children's public school library, they would have said, Nick, you're being ridiculous. Nobody wants to do that. And then they would gaslight you the moment that you proved that they did wanna do it. So that's where we're at right now. And the message I have for parents is show up to your school board and get upset and clearly vote for better people. But if you can, and believe me, there are more resources now than there has ever been to help you do this. If you can, pull your kids out of schools because that guy won with 65% of yeah. the vote and he's not done. Right. Verse 32 brings Romans chapter one to an end with a very bleak view of human nature. The point of the last half of the verse is to show that many people not only do things that they know deserve death, but also entice others to do them and approve when they do. In other words, the end point of depravity is not just the love affair with sin, but the desire to bring others with you to destruction. It's not just that people choose death for themselves in the passion of sin, but that they become suicidal at the spiritual level and assist others in eternal self-destruction by approving their sin. We are watching this play out right before our very eyes. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, 
wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un says Pyongyang would not hesitate to launch a nuclear attack if an enemy provokes it with nuclear weapons, state media reported on Thursday. Kim made the remark as he and his daughter met with soldiers working for the military's missile bureau. According to state media, Kim congratulated them on this week's missile launch, which has been widely condemned by the US, South Korea and Japan. North Korea on Monday fired an intercontinental ballistic missile that, according to Japanese officials, had a range of more than 9,000 miles and could hit anywhere in the U.S. At a meeting of the U.N. Security Council on Tuesday, Pyongyang was widely criticized. We have used every word to describe the DPRK's continued threats to international peace and security. Flagrant. Unacceptable reckless, egregious. All of these words still apply. But today, I offer another word, ridiculous. I must begin by expressing once again our condemnation in the strongest possible terms of the utterly unacceptable provocation by North Korea in violation of multiple Security Council resolutions. The U.S. and South Korea have increased the intensity of joint military drills, with South Korea's Defense Ministry releasing footage of soldiers shooting targets. Along with Japan, they have also activated a new system to detect and assess North Korea's missile launches in real time. Washington had until now shared such information separately with South Korea and Japan. North Korea has slammed the new system as part of U.S. efforts to incite confrontation. It says it has a sovereignty right to operate a ballistic missile program for self-defense. We have used every word to describe the DPRK's continued threats to international peace and security. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. A Hamas terror headquarters right under the heart of Gaza City. Israeli forces discovered the strategic network of tunnels among civilian buildings, including a school for deaf children. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has more. The tunnel runs under what's called the elite quarter of Gaza City, including Palestine Square. You can see behind me the community college. You can see there the Alpha, uh, Alpha Luna Social Society for Deaf Children. You can see government buildings. You can see civilian buildings. From outside, everything looks normal. Everything looks like a regular city. The square is the center of the strategic tunnel network housing Hamas leadership's strongholds. It connects to the underground infrastructure near the Rantisi Hospital and the Shifa Hospital uncovered earlier. The tunnel shafts are located in residences and offices of senior officials, allowing for covert descent, enabling Hamas operatives to escape and remain in hideouts for a long time. There's an electricity box here. This opens. This was closed. This is actually a door, not the back of a box, which reaches a space that leads to the tunnel shaft below. President Biden says the U.S. is still trying to restart negotiations for a ceasefire that includes a hostage release and humanitarian aid to Gaza. We're pushing it. We, I, I don't, there's no expectation at this point. 
but we are pushing. A top Hamas leader arrived in Egypt for talks, but the terror group says there will be no hostage negotiations without a ceasefire. Meanwhile, in the north, Israel struck Hezbollah infrastructure after the Iranian-backed group fired a rocket barrage that hit the city of Kiryat Shmona overnight, causing damage but no injuries. Now, Israel has launched airstrikes on several positions in southern Lebanon, targeting Hezbollah. The Lebanese armed group says six fighters were killed in the past 24 hours. Let's get more on that live now with Zena Hoda, who is in southern Lebanon. Uh, Zena, we've seen a lot of exchanges of fire in recent days, but this seems like a pretty big raid uh, by the Israelis on southern Lebanon. Well, yes, a series of airstrikes targeting what they're calling Hezbollah positions along the border. As of late, Israel has increased the intensity, the pace, the scope of its attacks. But the attacks are also becoming more direct surgical strikes, direct hits. The casualty toll suffered by the Lebanese armed group Hezbollah really is testament to that. Six fighters in the past 24 hours. In the past week, Hezbollah lost 17 fighters. Now, since the conflict began along the border 11 weeks ago, the group lost 113. So you can see the relatively high death toll in recent days. Now, sources are telling us that Israel is using technology. It is a technologically advanced army. It has drones in the sky. They, they don't leave the skies of southern Lebanon, just not, not just along the border, but in other areas of Lebanon considered to be Hezbollah strongholds. They are also intercepting telecommunications equipment. In the first few weeks of the conflict, Hezbollah attacks really concentrated on targeting Israeli surveillance towers, cameras along the border. It wanted to blind the enemy, but there's only so much it can do with drones in the skies, 24-7 in the skies. Now, Israel, no doubt, stepping up the pressure. It is part of a negotiating tactic because what Israel wants is for Hezbollah to agree to withdraw from the border, to pull back for, from the border so that the tens of thousands of Israelis can return to their homes in northern Israel. Now, while Israel says it prefers diplomacy, it is also threatening war. But Hezbollah, too, is not phased, saying it is ready for any, quote, aggression against the group or against the country. We're also following the new attacks. Iranian-backed militants taking aim yet again on commercial ships in the Red Sea. It comes just hours after the U.S. announced it was now leading an international naval task force with several nations. ABC's Britt Clenet tonight from Israel. Tonight, Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen launching two more attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, just as the U.S. announced a naval task force to counter the threat. The U.S. joining nine countries to escort vessels passing through the crucial trade route after major companies, including oil giant BP, paused operations. Bottom line is, these attacks have to stop. They need to stop. They're unacceptable. Uh, the United States, our allies and our partners will do what we have to do to counter these threats and to protect these ships. But the Houthis vowing further attacks in retaliation for Israel's war in Gaza. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. To the urgent flooding situation in New Jersey, the deadly storm earlier this week is causing the river to overflow, leading to rescues and evacuations. Rob Marciano is near the river in Wayne, New Jersey, with the latest. Hey, good morning, Michael. Hard to believe that we're dealing with this sort of flooding in December in the Northeast. Certainly feels like a climate change fingerprint. Uh, the rivers right now here, the Passaic River, cresting at record levels, hasn't been this high since August of 2011. That was Hurricane, Hurricane Irene. Now it's been nearly two days since the rain has stopped here and people are still having to be rescued from the rising water. Overnight, with parts of the Northeast still underwater, urgent rescues happening in the dark of night. 
flashing lights illuminating first responders in North Jersey as they search for stranded homeowners, families pulled from homes. Rescuing them in those locations is not an easy task. It's something that may at some point become impossible. A dialysis patient carried to safety in Patterson, New Jersey. From Maine to New Hampshire and Vermont, residents reeling in the wake of that powerful and deadly storm. This road in Maine washed away. Water damage everywhere. It's been like this for two days. Countless cars covered by feet of water. This couple in Wayne, New Jersey, using a shovel to paddle their boat to dry land after the first floor of their home was flooded. You're going to have to fix the houses. You're going to be out of the house in months. Barris Oster climbed to the roof where he could see his neighbor's house, surrounded by floodwaters, fully engulfed in flames. First responders blocked from getting to it, spraying it down from a distance. Entire communities remained underwater after this week's deadly storm system overwhelmed rivers and flooded roads up and down the East Coast. Just looked like a big swimming pool, like everything was covered in just water. First responders waded through the knee-high water to save people from inundated homes Tuesday. In Passaic County, New Jersey, hundreds were ordered to evacuate over concerns rescue teams would be unable to reach them as the floodwaters rise. It was like white water rapids coming, coming down the driveway right here. Where the water has receded. Emergency crews are repairing crumbled streets and down power lines. The worst of the system has moved on, but with more storms expected across the country in the coming days. Roaring walls of water, leaving a trail of destruction across parts of South India. The state government here blamed the chaos on what it called record rain, heavier than forecast showers and warnings which came a bit late. All our gas cylinders and kitchen items were swept away in the floods. There is nothing to eat. Our situation is very bad. Local administrators say Tirunelveli and Tutikarin were the worst affected. Hundreds were stranded by rising floodwaters. Rescue teams worked hard to reach vulnerable victims like this pregnant woman and this young baby trapped by the floods. Cooked food and ration packs were being distributed to those trapped by the floods. The deluge occurred while the state was still recovering from the damage caused by Cyclone Michon, which lashed the coast earlier this month, killing at least 13 people. Jesus declares this in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. There are many people within the church who are teaching that homosexuality is not a sin, when scripture clearly says it is. This is another sign Jesus gave to look for prior to his second coming, as we read in Matthew 24:11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16.49-50 Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. 
God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Just to see a room full of people that have come together and who have also longed for and dreamed of a place like this to, to take shape, it really does bring tears to my eyes. Tears of joy for Pastor Sawyer Vanden Heuvel, a gay man who grew up in a small town and shed many tears of shame from a conservative church background that taught him being gay was a sin. There is past trauma there and there's past hurt there, but when I stepped foot into a, an ELCA congregation for the first time and truly felt welcome to participate, in all of the goodness that comes in worship and in community life. I think that was a first step. He was 20 years old and had lived in Sioux Falls for two years. ELCA stands for the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Sawyer so embraced it, he became a pastor at St. Mark's this past October, while also starting Shepherd's Table. I can bring those life experiences and stories from my own personal life and translate that into a way uh, to make an impactful difference on people's lives. One of those people is Tyler Agee, who had a similar upbringing to Sawyer. It took quite a while to kind of unpack the pieces of that and be able to come to terms with the fact that God loves me just as I am and God loves all people just as they are. Tyler moved to Sioux Falls last year and found friendship in the Rainbow Chorus, South Dakota's first all LGBTQ plus choir. But being a part of a faith-based support system like Shepherd's Table brought a whole new level of pride for Tyler at Sunday's launch, especially while singing Silent Night. That brought him to tears. The gathering together and in all of our diversity to talk about and be reminded how much God loves us um, and then the singing together just on top of it. I've got a chill just now. <laughs> um, just a beautiful moment. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in his church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3, 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. 
I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Tonight, the powerful tremors set off a scramble in northwestern China. People running from homes and buildings into the frigid night. At the earthquake's epicenter, an all-out search for survivors. Videos and photos shared by Chinese state media showing people pulled from the rubble. At least 127 are dead and scores are injured. Local officials say nearly 5,000 buildings were destroyed. Freezing temperatures at high altitude, making rescue operations more of a challenge. China's earthquake agency said the trembler measured magnitude 6.2 at a depth of just six miles, centered in Jushishan, a remote and impoverished county along the Tibetan Plateau, an area where earthquakes are not uncommon, but this is the deadliest in nearly a decade. More than 300 aftershocks have followed, according to state media, thousands now huddling in temporary shelters and bitter conditions. With a cold wave gripping much of northern China, rescue officials say the next 48 hours are crucial, a race against time and temperatures to find survivors. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. The eruption of a volcano in Iceland is still underway this morning. The government said it could last for months. Sofia Batitsa, with our partners at the BBC, is near the scene about 30 miles from the capital. This is as close as we could get to the volcano before the authorities stopped us. Now, it's very cloudy this morning, so it's quite hard to see the volcano in the distance. But overnight, more lava has been flowing, and the authorities here are asking people not to come to this area for their safety, but also to allow scientists and responders to assess the situation on the ground. Now, the authorities here say that this eruption does not pose a threat to life. And so far, there have been no reports of any, of any injuries. The biggest risk for people who live near the volcano are volcanic fumes. They're not dangerous, but they can be very uncomfortable for elderly people or for people with breathing problems. Now, we spoke to a local police officer and she told us that the priority now is to try and save the town of Grindavik. It was evacuated a few weeks ago 
as a precaution, but there are risks now that the lava could damage the town. And so the police are working on a plan to go back to people's houses and collect the most valuable belongings. So the people who have been evacuated are probably not going to be able to get back to their homes anytime soon. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.